<clears throat> now, I am going to give you another passage to turn to. It's Colossians 2 to start this out. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be talking about all these passages today. Chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And what we see then is philosophies of men. We see philosophies of men. We have the greatest philosophy of mankind today in the world, and it's uh, called psychology. And so we see that today, and it's basically the philosophies of men on how things should be and how things are. So it's man's definition. So here we are, along with the philosophies of men and the, and the philosophy and false religion of psychology, we see a term called narcissist, which you've heard before, the term narcissist. And the Mayo Clinic defines narcissist as this. Narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder is a mental health condition in which people have an unreasonably high sense of their own importance. They need, they need and seek too much attention and want people to admire them. People with this disorder may lack the ability to understand or care about the feelings of others. Hmm. It sounds to me as their description of, of, of this situation is pretty valid. Yes, we've seen people like that, but that's their definition. And it says that the causes, though, this is what the philosophies of men say. This is what psychology says, according to Wikipedia. The causes of this whole narcissistic behavior and internal belief system is this. See if this makes any sense to you. A combination of genetic and environmental fact factors, including trauma, neglect, and rejection in childhood. Those are supposedly the causes, according to the philosophies of man, that Paul warns us to reject. <laughs> the Bible describes this symptom, this scenario. Yet the Bible doesn't call it a personality disorder or a mental health condition. This is what the Bible says. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3. But realize this. In the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they denied its power. And the last part is, avoid such men as these. That's what the Bible says about them. And so, basically, the Bible decides describes and defines narcissism as sin. The Bible just calls it sin. And this is what we've seen in the book of Jude. It describes all the false teachers. They all fall into this category. And guess what? It describes all unbelievers. Every single unbeliever worships himself instead of God. It describes Everybody in this room before they got saved. It also describes our fleshly tendency to keep um, doing that. That's, everyone here, the world would say, in their natural flesh is a narcissist. They're only concerned with themselves. They're only concerned with themselves. But the passage we're going to be in today, 1 Thessalonians 3 one through three displays three areas of a godly leader's concerns for his flock that will help you to be a godly leader and to help you appreciate a godly leader. 
So, but first we'll look at this background again because what we're going to get into is a long section of what the Bible genre here is called. Uh, mo uh, most of it is, it's a mixture, but uh, it's a mixture of, of teaching or didactic training, but also of narrative. So I'm just going to give you the story, the overview of the story, so that when we get to these big chunks, you will already have this basic understanding of the story. So we're studying Paul's first letter of the two letters to the Thessalonians. We're studying that. Paul had preached in this city, Thessalonica, for approximately three months, including three Sabbaths at the temple, I mean at the synagogue, to the Jews. And then they started the church there. So he had three months with these people. He had three months with these people. But then he was forced to leave due to civil unrest against him there. You see this in Acts 17. Okay, so so far what I've said is, oh, Paul just bailed out. Oh, it got too hot in the kitchen before he bailed out. But, but this is the thing. We'll, we'll see more about this, his attitude, in a minute. Even though the church didn't have Paul and his team of Timothy and Silas to lead them, even though the leaders were gone, the reputation was well known throughout the Greek world and the Roman world as being a fruitful church. And Paul even then described them as the model church. They had hardly any leadership other than the first three months. And, and so, but they still grew. Who, who led them? The Holy Spirit led them. Even though they were baby Christians, Paul viewed them as a model church. And here's the story of Paul's sudden departure. Did Paul bail out because it got too hot in the kitchen? Let's see here. Paul and his team, the three of them, had to prematurely leave Thessalonica due to the hostility against them. Get this and the other believers in the area. With this, for the sake of persecution against his new brothers, Paul, as the so-called troublemaker, had to leave. Now, this is the thing you got to get. Paul was totally used to getting personally persecuted, right? We've read the stories, all these beatings, all this imprisonment, all, all these things that happened to him. He didn't bail out on them because it got too hot in the kitchen. He was doing it for their own good. He couldn't even return to Thessalonica at all because of a faithful brother named Jason. We see this in Acts chapter 17. Gave a pledge to the government or to the, the leaders that we will make sure that Paul and his guys don't come and cause any more trouble so he gave us a pledge of personal property and basically probably a threat against him for jail time if Paul and the leaders came back and caused more trouble, supposedly. So Paul was concerned about them getting more persecuted and harassed. Like I said, Paul was used to it. He's a big boy. He's, he, he doesn't, he's not a crybaby. And he knew that he had to stay away for their benefit. He had to stay away for their good on one hand, for their good to stay away. Yet on the other hand, not being able to disciple this new church as much as he would like, he was in a dilemma. So he sent Timothy back to help strengthen and encourage the church. I don't know if Timothy had to wear special sunglasses or disguise, but the bottom line is the troublemaker, Paul, wasn't going to go back because it would then cause problems for the Thessalonians. So he had to send Timothy back. Paul had already sent Silas to Philippi right around the same time to minister to the Christians there because they needed leadership also. So his team was separated, and Paul's left by himself. Now, with Paul, he had this dilemma because he wanted to be with his spiritual children, and he knew that they needed his leadership. We learned last time that he was they were torn apart as an orphan torn from the parents, and he was hurting. He knew they needed his leadership. They knew they, they, he, they at least needed some leadership. And he feared for their well-being through the affliction and temptation that they were going through. He knew they were going through these things. He was concerned about it. And at the same time, he was, didn't like being alone. It hated being, he hated being alone. 
And yet, seeing the need, he sent Timothy to Thessalonica, leaving him behind at Athens alone. So this is what brings us here. He was left by himself in Athens. And as you know, it's not fun being a Christian and being separated from every other Christian. This is what he's going through. So we're going to see now it brings us right to this passage, First Thessalonians 3, 1 through 13, which is going to show us three areas of godly concerns for his flock that will help you to be a godly leader and to appreciate a godly leader. See, people don't always appreciate their leaders. So by, like I've been saying for a few sermons now, is by understanding the pressure that someone's under being a godly leader, they are have to answer to God for these things. So these things that we're learning about what a godly leader looks like should then help us to recognize that some, when somebody's doing their job. So it's going to help us to be a godly leader and to appreciate one. So first we're going to see a godly leader's personal concern for his flock. Verse 1, therefore, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. So we sent Timothy and our brother, I'm sorry, so we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. So with this, Paul had personal concern for his flock. And it is seen in these three different things in this passage here. It's seen in his affection towards them. He has this affection towards them. Therefore, it says we can endure it no longer. Have you ever missed somebody? And you're like, man, I am, I, I'm so alone and I miss these other Christians. Or I miss my family of believers. And I, I'm miserable because I miss them, because I have an affection for them. This was, these were Paul's spiritual children, and he missed them, and he had a strong affection for their value to him. He had a high value of them. He saw them also as being very valuable as God's children, given to him as a stewardship. So it wasn't just a personal <laughs> of, wow, I, I really... Uh, have a phileo love for these people, meaning an affectionate love for these people. I also recognize that they're my stewardship, and I need to have an agape or agape love for them, meaning to be concerned for their well-being. So he had both. So he had the natural affection coming from him where he actually liked these people, not just loved them. Just as Christ to his church, and a husband is to be towards his wife. Ephesians 5, verse 28, we read earlier. So, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes, cherishes it, just as Christ does also the church. And so, he had an affection and saw their importance as Christ, as Paul is telling us about how Christ has an affection for us, how he recognizes us, as weaker vessels, and as he recognizes our fragility, and that he need, that he has this, he's drawn to us uh, as somebody valuable and important, just as a husband is to his wife. And so, therefore, with this, Paul loved them in a sensitive manner, seeing their fragility and weakness, and wanting to go and, and be close to them, and hold them, and hug them. Paul viewed this flock, as we learned last time, as his pride and joy. His personal concern was seen in his affection for them. His personal concern was also seen in his sacrifice for them. He said, we thought it best, and, and, and I'm going to explain this in a minute, but we thought it best to be left alone, at, at be, I'm sorry, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. Now, right simultaneously, you know, the we is Paul and Silas um, sending Timothy, but at the same time, si he sent Silas right away to uh, Philippi, so we thought it was best uh, to let be left alone, but it was actually Paul and Silas that decided it best, and then Silas immediately took off, and Paul's by himself. And we know from 2 Timothy 2, too, that it, it was torture to Paul to be left alone. He was crying out for Timothy 
to send somebody to help him when he was in prison. He was miserable being by himself, as it is for all of us. We're, it's not good for man to be alone. And that's the, that's the thing. Is that, But he sacrificed this and sent Timothy anyway. And we know then because Satan wants to divide and conquer. So what happens when you're over there by yourself and you don't come to church and you're not with the brethren for a while and he's all over you? And it's miserable being separated. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says we're commanded to gather. And, and we all sit here and say, well, you don't need to command me to gather. I have to. I can't stand being alone. But it's a command because, because Satan will divide and conquer. And so Paul's getting slammed by himself, but he knew he needed to do this. So he had just displayed the same sacrifice for the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 15. Just as Christ did for the church and as a husband is to do for his wife, self-sacrifice. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You think Christ gave himself up for the church? Yes. That's how a husband's supposed to be. That's what Paul's demonstrating. That's what a godly leader looks like. Sacrificial love. Therefore, while hating to be alone, he knew it was the best thing for them to send his only companion. And so we see that his personal concern for his flock was seen in his affection for them, seen their value and, and wanting to be close to them his sacrifice for them, even though he didn't want to be alone. And then the third one we see is his loyalty in verse 2. His loyalty to them. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Paul sent his right-hand man to them. Basically, as we see, it appears as though he was his best guy that he sent to them. He sent, now nothing against the other guys, he sent Silas to Philippi, but he sent Timothy here, and he gave his credentials. It says, as our brother and God's fellow worker. Hey, I'm sending you the top of the, the best of the best right here. Because he was concerned about them. He had a loyalty, and it hurt Paul to send Timothy, but he was loyal to the Thessalonians, so it had to be done. And we see this same loyalty with Christ towards us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, as his people, this is he, he showed us that in Matthew 28, 20. And while we're on the same subject, a husband is to have the same loyalty to his wife. A husband is to have the same loyalty to his wife, just as Christ does the church. Because, Jesus said, or Paul says, because we are members of his body. It needs to be a loyalty. We are members of his body. Verse 31, for this reason, a man shall leave his wife and mother and shall be joined to his wife. I'm sorry, leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Ephesians 5, 30 and 31. So a godly leader's personal concern for his flock are seen in his affection towards the people. He's drawn to them. His sacrifice towards his flock and his loyalty towards his flock. Then we see in the same section, the godly leader also has pastoral concern for his flock. So you're going to need to make sure you got, uh, you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to be in verse 10, and we're going to read through this section about his pastoral concern for his flock, and then we're going to dig in a little bit. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Verse 3. So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when you were with us, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer... I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Verse 6, but now that Timothy has come to us from you, he has brought good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to, to see us just as we are longing to see you. And so by now, Timothy has now returned to Paul 
And Paul's got great relief because he had these concerns. Verse 7, For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. We were comforted about you through your faith. Verse 8, For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy which we rejoice before our God on your account? So now Paul is so excited. He knows that his flock's doing well, and he's so relieved. And he's sharing this all with them. Verse 10, As night and day we kept praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. With this, a godly leader not only has personal concern for his flock, but he also has pastoral concern for his flock. And sometimes they seem to um, collide a little bit when you're trying to lead a flock and you know that some things that you have to teach them might be painful and that it might collide a little bit with your affection towards them and wanting them to be happy all the time. A little bit of conflict occurs, but both of them are there. Both of them are there, personal concern and also pastoral concern. And so here, Paul then describes six areas of pastoral concern for the Thessalonians. First, his concern for them is their faithfulness in affliction, verse 2 to 4. He sent Timothy to them to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith is what he says. Strengthen means to establish, like where you're grounded, where nothing's going to move you. And we see this in Psalm 1, what a, a person of God looks like firmly established, that all the stuff could come, all the winds. We, Jesus describes it as the foundation in Matthew 7. And then to encourage in the Greek actually, <clears throat> in the Greek actually says to exhort, which means to preach or to win over to you. We sent Timothy to help strengthen you and to make sure that you're on the right side. So make sure to preach to them. Say, so you got to get this. You guys got to get this. And the reason why, verse 3, is so that no one would be disturbed by this, these afflictions because they're still going through stuff. Why? Because they're Christians. <laughs> and that's what happens to Christians. And so disturbed means try to move something from their position they are supposed to be in when they are weak and being lured away. That's what disturbed means, is somebody that is where they're supposed to be, and somebody's disturbing them off of where they're supposed to be and trying to pull them over the other way using enticement or luring. Paul was concerned about them being lured away. Why? Because they were weak. They were weak and they were alone. Remember we talked about how Satan operates? This then is the much needed discipleship of new believers as Satan is trying to trip them up and make them stumble. They need discipleship. New believers need to be attached to somebody who will disciple them and pull them out. Hey, don't be off by yourself. You need to be over here part of the flock because you're going to get messed up. Satan will mess with you. And, see if this sounds familiar, to help them with any doubts of God's love towards them. You ever uh, feel like that as a Christian when you've been away for a little while and you you kind of start being by yourself and you feel like, I wonder if God really loves me. I just I feel all alone and I wonder if he, David cried, cried out to the, about this all the time in the Psalms. Like, Lord, I feel like I'm separated from you. Where are you? And he wanted to encourage them in their doubts that they may have had of God's love towards them. This is needed then to reinforce their understanding as their status of being God's children. Hey, you're God's children. I'm reminding you, you're, as long as you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing, and not drifting over there, don't worry, everything's fine. Therefore, if you're one of God's children, you're forgiven of all that stuff. Somebody wants to keep reminding you of all that stuff. If you're God's child, according to the gospel, because you've turned to Jesus Christ, recognizing that you're a sinner, and that he did a perfect life, and that he's exchanging rap sheets with you, and you have now been saved, you're saved, and you have eternal security, and you don't have to worry about your sin anymore. But when you're up by yourself, you drift away, Satan's going to mess with you. You're not really forgiven. You're not really wanting to see you're even thinking about doing it again. It's going to mess with you. See if this sounds familiar to anybody in here. Therefore, as a child of God, you're forgiven with eternal security, which means nobody can take you out of God's hand, and you'll never lose your salvation. That's what the preachers and the discipleship means, is that everybody in this room, the disciple one another, Hey, you're a child of God. Let's just keep moving. 
Don't worry about all that stuff. With this, as you know, affliction causes people to second-guess these things, so Paul comforted them with these things. And he reminded him them of something that we need to be reminded of all the time. Verse 3 and 4, For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Let's chew on this for a minute. We're talking about the word of affliction, and Paul says, For you, you know this already, that we've been destined for this whole affliction thing. And, and when, when your life looks like it's going great, and the guy over there, your brother, is saying, I, I'm having a rough time, and he looks over at your life, and, and you walk around and say, oh, yeah, my life's perfect. He's going to feel like he's, he or she's going to feel like he's off by himself and that not really of God. But when we encourage each other saying, hey, you know, I've been through that or I've been through this, but here, um, don't believe the lie. We've all been through these things is what Paul's saying is, don't be all off by yourself thinking you're the only one that's getting beat up. When you sign up to be a Christian, you're signing up for this. And we see this, this is the life of a Christian, Philippians 1.29. Not only has it been appointed for you to be saved, let's have a party, but also to suffer for his sake. It's part of the deal. Paul said this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You think we need each other every week to come together and say, hey, remember, 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 we're all going through this. We're all in this together. Jesus warned us of this, that this would happen in uh, Matthew 5, 11, and 12, that this would happen to his believers. With this, a godly leader is concerned with the faithfulness of his flock during their affliction. A godly leader wants to make sure, hey, everybody in this room, hey, you need to remember these things, and I'm concerned about how come I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. Well, I hope they're okay, because if they're by themselves, they're going to get chewed up. We see this. Faithfulness, then, in temptation, he's concerned, a godly leader is con concerned about, pastorally concerned about his flock's faithfulness in temptation. When temptation comes, verse 5, Paul's concern for them then included his fear that the tempter might have tempted them. And the tempter is Satan himself who personally tempted Eve and personally tempted Christ in Matthew 4. He's not going to personally tempt everybody here unless you're really important, but somebody that's working for him will. So he's, he can't be everywhere at once, but somebody working for him could tempt you. And, and does he? Yes. The tempter then is the one who attempts to snatch away godly seeds planted before they take root. And we talked about that the other day. We see that in the parable of the soils in Matthew 13. And we see that the tempter, when you're hearing the sermon today, or you're hearing the word of God on the radio, or wherever you're, and you're reading the word, or you're being discipled, and then you leave, he wants to get that, he wants to put your mind on something else real quick so he can snatch up what you just heard. That's what he does. Paul had warned the Ephesians elders of this upon his departure from them. He's going to be leaving them and at a very difficult time leaving the Ephesian elders because they knew that they'd never see Paul again because he it was all laid out that he was going to die which he did Ephesians Acts I'm sorry Acts uh, chapter 20 29 tells us this Paul is saying to them I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and from among you your own selves men will arise in other words, people that are really close to you are going to pop up, speaking perverse things to draw you away, draw the disciples away after them. This is what happens when there's not godly leadership, is that the wolves will pop up and uh, look it around. Is, uh, is, the, is the lion of Judah or his representatives here? Nope. And the wolf is going to go in and try to change your people. That means your children, that means your wife, that means everybody that you are leading. Paul sent Timothy to protect them from the savage wolves of false doctrine. And with this, a godly leader is concerned with the faithfulness of his flock from temptation. A godly leader is also concerned for his flock in their faithfulness in love. Verse 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. But now that Timothy has come to you from us, I'm sorry, has come for, to, to us from you, 
and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. He was comforted by their love. And this is what we see as what we call the, uh, in, the, in the Greek, the agape or agape love. It's reciprocal. It's the same love that God gives us that we then give back to him and that we give to the people around us, starting with uh, the brethren. And this is described in 1 John 4, 7. Jesus said that we would all be known as his by the world, by our love for one another. How did those people get together? How did those people get married? How did those people become friends? How did those people all wind out at the same house at the Super Bowl party when they're all from all these different cultures? How did they wind up together? They actually care about each other. That's, that's what Christians look like. And we're looking forward to the eternal state in the millennial kingdom where uh, all of our ethnicities and all these backgrounds will come together and showcase all this. While the enemy wants everybody that's different to fight with each other, uh, we get to see this uh, going on. And the world will be amazed and is amazed, hopefully, when we all get together. Like, what's up with those people? That, why do they have such a love for him? Because we're, we're of Christ. And in seeing their love for him, Paul was encouraged because he was concerned because the false accusations that came to him when he had to leave so quickly. See, this is what the bullies do. Is they go and they bully people. And then when people have to make adjustments to the bully, they say, for example, the guy that stands up against the bully who has to leave, like Paul had to leave for their sake. Now the bully says, oh, look, see, he left, he bailed out on you because he doesn't really love you. I mean, this is how bullies operate. And they're the same everywhere. But it's a matter of, Paul left because they were bullying the people, and the reason he left is so they'd stop bullying the people, and then as soon as he left, the bully said, oh, he le they left because they don't care about you. So Paul was so thankful that the, the Thessalonians didn't buy into it and knew why Paul left and knew that Paul loved them, and they loved Paul, and Paul was so relieved because he thought, man, these guys are going to you know, talk smack about us, and they're going to be doing all this, and he was so thankful that they actually remembered and recognized that they cared, him and Timothy and, and, and Silas cared. So Paul was relieved. And so a godly leader is concerned with his flock's faithfulness of love for God and each other. And a godly leader is concerned about his flock's faithfulness and perseverance. Verse 8, for now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. This is a perseverance. If you stand firm in the Lord, this represents their establishment in the Lord, which we talked about, and it's in Psalm 1. And also we talked about it a, a few weeks ago. And what this is, this establishment is, like I said, it's firmly rooted. So when all the stuff comes, all the winds, all the storm, you don't get moved. This is faithfulness and perseverance that he's concerned about. This will then carry them to glory through them, and these are the ways that they are to do it. Paul laid out in Ephesians chapter 6, is to stand firm. He was praying that they would stand firm. And how is this that they stand firm? Well, Ephesians 6 tells us to put on the armor of God. It means to stand firm in the truth we already know about God, that we just put on all the, all the armor that reminds us of our salvation and that God is, is our leader and we work for him, and no one can take us away, and we are to stand firm against the enemy, uh, resisting the devil so that he will flee. Jason, I'm sorry, James 4, 7 says that we are then to resist the devil so that he will flee. Standing firm says, nope. Aren't you going to move? Nope. Yeah, but what about this? Nope. That's what standing firm means. Is what about this? Nope. That's what standing firm means. So a godly leader is concerned for his flock's faithfulness and perseverance and their faithfulness of encouragement. See if this sounds good. Anybody like the word encouragement? Verses uh, 7 through 9. Verse 7 we see here. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were very comforted about you through your faith. Wow. Paul was comforted by their faith. He was comforted by them. Verse 9. For what thanks could we render to God for you in return for all the joy which we rejoice before our God on your account? Meaning, because of you, we have a whole bunch of joy now. 
were comforted by you. A godly leader is actually encouraged by the fruit of their people. So a godly leader is encouraged. Paul then was encouraged by the Thessalonians, so he encouraged them that they had encouraged him. And this is what we call reciprocal encouragement among the brethren. And we see it in Romans 1, 12, 2 Corinthians 7, 4, Philemon 7. It's what we do is, uh, we talked about this the other day, is that, wow, brother, I'm encouraged by what I just heard you telling me about what happened. I'm encouraged by your fruit, and I want you to know that you encouraged me by your fruit, and I want you to be encouraged that you're doing the right thing. It's a reciprocal encouragement. My, my dad was great at that when we were kids. He would, he would say, he would tell us that he was encouraged by us. He would appreciate us. He wouldn't just go off and tell everybody else, yeah, I appreciated what so-and-so, my son did. Instead, he would tell us, and it would encourage us even more because we liked being encouraged. See, encouragement is reciprocal. It's just like love. You have to just keep recognizing, even in the midst of all the other stuff somebody might just be doing wrong, you better address, but you did this part right, and that was an encouragement to me, and I want to encourage you that I saw that. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. And like I said, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Romans 1, 12, 2 Corinthians 7, 4, and Philemon 7. It's basically, as we see in Philippians 2, 13, it's an encouragement to other Christians when you tell them you recognize their fruit. You're doing a good job. I don't know if you noticed, but I, I saw that you did this, and I just want you to know I saw this. Keep up the good work. This encouragement, and then we're going to see as we get into next week's sermon, he then it, this, this then encourages them to excel even more. Doesn't it? When somebody's saying, hey, you're doing a good job, doesn't that encourage you to even press on and even do more? And that's what encouragement is. So a godly leader is concerned for his flock's faithfulness of encouragement. It's a reciprocal thing. A godly leader wants to encourage them and wants to be encouraged by them. And it's just this ongoing, wonderful relationship. And then, verse 10, a godly leader is concerned about, pastorally concerned about the faithfulness of the growth of the flock. Faithfulness and growth. Verse 10. As we night and day kept praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. That we may see your face and complete what is lacking in your faith. And this means to complete what's needed. What's lacking. And what that means for everybody in this room is we all are lacking in thing, in growth. We all need to grow. And he's saying he wants to be there to participate in their growth. He's not bagging on them. He's saying, but there's room for improvement. Well, everybody in this room better understand that. All of us, if we think that we've arrived, uh, that's a lie. We all need to grow. A godly leader's concern that we would all excel even more. So Paul wanted to disciple them, and and he was called to do so for their growth. And this is what Paul has said to the Ephesians about godly leaders in the church anyway. We're going to see this. Godly leaders in the church are called for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all obtain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. This is Ephesians 4, 12, and 13. A godly leader has the goal and the pastoral concern <clears throat> to help his people to grow. And we see this same concern. These pastoral concerns overall that we talked about for his flock are instructed for husbands also being demonstrated by Christ towards his beloved church. Ephesians 5 again, verse 26. This is Christ's concern. So that he might sanctify her, means his body, his, his, his church, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word. That's what we're doing today. We're being washed by the word so that we may grow. Verse 27. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. This is then the sanctifying love that a godly leader has towards his flock overall 
wanting them to grow and succeed and to put away sin and to not be uptight, but to grow. So a godly leader has personal concern for his flock. He has pastoral concern for his flock, and he has prayerful concern for his flock right at the end of the section here. Verse 11, a godly leader has prayerful concern for his flock. Now may the God and Father himself and, and Lord, and I'm sorry, and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we do for you, so that he might establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So a godly leader has a prayerful concern for his flock. He prays for his flock. And with this then, Paul lays out three prayer requests that he has regarding his flock in Thessalonica. The first prayer request, see if this sounds familiar, is that God would clear the way for him to personally return to them. May, the, may our God and Father himself and Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, that he would actually help him to return to them. Because we learn in verse in chapter 2, verse 18, that he had been hindered by Satan to try to return to them. So with this, see if this sounds familiar, in application, a godly leader will pray that he can be connected to his flock. A godly leader prays to be connected to his flock even more and more. The second request is that the flock would abound in love even more, as they even more than they already had. And we see here, it's not just for God and the saints, but for all people. That they would have found a love for God, and for each other, and for all people, which is what how God loves the world. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Love for all people, as God does. Therefore, Romans 12, 17 says, then to be at peace with all people while they're getting slammed, remember? They're getting hammered. To be at peace with all people. And Jesus gives us this in Matthew 5, 44, even to love your enemies. This is loving all people. Just as Paul and his team had <clears throat> once loved them, when they were pagan Gentile Thessalonians doing all kinds of nasty stuff, and Paul and his team loved them when they were nasty. Love for all people. Yet, at the same time, Paul teaches in Galatians 6.10, there's an understanding that you have a priority for other believers than you do for people that aren't believers. Galatians 6.10 tells us that especially have a love for the brethren. So, a godly leader will pray for the love of his flock to all people. His third prayer request was that the flock would be blameless in holiness, meaning to avoid sin. And he's going to discuss that later. We're going to actually be getting into that uh, starting next week, that his people would avoid sin, that they would be blameless in, holy, blameless in holiness, and that they would constantly repent for sin then. 1 John 1, 19. In other words, avoid sin, but when you do sin, repent. That's the thing that we, a godly leader needs to teach and pray for his people, that they would avoid sin, and when they do sin, though, that they would constantly repent. Therefore, dealing with sin. A godly leader prays for his flock to deal with their sin. That means putting... It to death, like Jesus talked about in Luke 9.23. If anyone wishes to follow me, if anybody wishes to come after me, he must, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's an ongoing process of getting your feet washed uh, by forgiveness because you every day you're going to sin. Therefore, then, he talks about fixing their hope on the day of Christ's return. Romans 8.17 30 gives us some of that, but it says here then, with all the saints, and we see that that's going to be at the rapture, and we're going to be talking about that in a few weeks, 
he's saying he's going to come back any minute. And I'm saying to you, he's going to come back any minute. And you want to be squared away when he comes. You don't want to be off over there. What's what? What's going on? What's that person doing over there? You don't want to be that guy. You want to be doing, found doing what you're supposed to be doing. Meaning, keep your eye and recognize he could come anytime. Recognize this. He's always watching anyway. But you don't want to be the one that's caught in the middle of something when he shows up. You don't want to be that guy. Therefore, a godly leader will pray for the faithful holiness of his flock. So we see then in this whole passage, long passage, 13 verses, displays three areas of a godly leader's concerns for his flock that will help you to be a godly leader and to appreciate one. Once again, and what do I mean by appreciate one? It means if you're shopping for a godly leader, if you're trying out a new church, if you're trying out uh, who might be your husband, you, you need to see what a godly leader looks like so that when you when you see him, you'll say, oh, okay, I can see this now. And uh, or you might have a godly leader right in your midst and you say, I don't like uh, the way this godly leader is. But then you see that, well, actually, the godly leaders doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's what we're supposed to teach. This lesson is for all of us here, because then just like you guys, I submit have to submit to godly leader. This is the way it is. Personal concern then for this flock is what the godly leader has. Personal concern with affection, sacrifice and loyalty. He has pastoral concern for his flock with their sanctification, wanting them to grow in godliness, and prayerful concern for his flock that he would then be connected to his flock, that they would love God and love others, and that they would be holy. So worldly leaders, false leaders are called, what do we call them, uh, narcissists are concerned for themselves. The whole world is that way. Like I said, everybody in this room was once a narcissist. If you're not a, if you're a Christian now, you used to be a narcissist. If you're not a Christian now, you're a narcissist. You only care about yourself. You worship the God of yourself. A godly leader has concern for his flock as opposed to a worldly leader that only has uh, concern for himself. With this then, as Paul demonstrates this from a church leader's perspective, as we said, but yet, as we see in Ephesians 5, we can see that these are the same concerns of Christ for his church, and therefore the same concerns a husband should have for his wife, which means what we can see here is, is that, and, and Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, that Paul commands that in order to be a godly leader in the church, a man must be a godly leader at home. So therefore, these concerns for the flock should also be for a man's leadership in his family and the church and even women with their leadership roles uh, leading other women and children. This pertains to everybody in here. Every part of it is, is to, so that you can be a godly leader and that you can appreciate a godly leader. That's what all this is for, and there's nothing left out. Everybody in this room is affected, even the kids in this situation. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father.